So the time has finally come to wrap up the 1-2 portion of this vlog. This is the final 1-2 episode of this series, and then we're going to be jumping up to 2-5. But I figured I'd end the 1-2 portion on a nice high positive note with a very nice profitable session. But just because it was profitable does not mean that all these spots were totally straightforward. So I figured let's review all of them and have some fun with it. Good morning. How are we doing today? My name is James Sweeney, aka Split Suit. Welcome to episode 11 of the vlog. And in this one, we are in Orange City, Florida playing a little bit of 1-2 with a 200 max buy. Without further ado, let's jump right into the first hand. All right, this first hand, we are in the small blind. Look down at ace-king off. There's a $10 raise by the hijack, called by the button. Both of them are shorter stacked. So definitely going to be going for a 3-bet here and decide to squeeze it up to 40 total. Get called by the hijack. Button waits for a little bit and then ends up shoving the rest of it in. So it's not too much more, but it does reopen action at this point. So I do have the option to call here or shove myself. I decide to shove. And at this point, we're pretty much playing Ace King with roughly 50 big blinds effective. And pretty much it takes a crowbar for me to get rid of Ace King for that effective stack size preflop. So mind you, I've only been at the table for about 15 minutes. I have already been outed as a vlogger, but I don't think that's really factoring in too, too much in this exact situation. So I don't have like tremendous reads on either of these players, but I do think that the hijack is going to have more strong hands in their range than the button is, even though the button did decide to shove all in prefop. So I like shoving here myself just to see if there's any chance that I could get the hijack to fold something like pocket nines, pocket tens, pocket jacks. I'm not saying they should, but I see one, two players make that mistake often enough that I'd rather just shove here rather than call the all in and then just pretty much play a nothing pot going on the flop. If I can generate any semblance of fold equity whatsoever from hands that have slight equity edges on me right this moment, like the pocket pairs, I am very, very happy with that. And we just absolutely dominate the buttons range overall. It's going to be a lot of hands in their shoving range that we just have literally dominated. So I'm very, very happy with this overall play. I think shoving is better than just going for the call here for what it's worth. So with all that said, we shove hijack eventually makes a call show my hand quickly which i've talked about in other videos about why i do this hijack shows pocket tens button not shocking shows up with a hand that we absolutely dominate king queen flop comes out queen ten six turn is a beautiful jack rivers a seven and we end up scooping the entire thing so really no complaints about the results whatsoever. But again, this is a spot where I think getting it all on prefop and playing it aggressively at all inflection points is going to be much, much better. And of course, winning coin flips is always very helpful too. All right, this next hand, a little while later, we end up looking down at King 10 off in the small blind. It's an open limp from the hijack, limp behind by the cutoff, limp behind by the button. I just decided to complete here instead of going for the raise. I think raising and getting called in a bunch of spots is going to make this very bloated and tricky, especially out of position. So I just decided to put this at the top of my completion range. The flop is absolutely beautiful at ace queen jack with a flush draw. So flopping the nuts is always fun. Decide to leave this out for 10. And I think betting here is 100% standard. And as for the bet size, I think into a $10 pot, betting just 10 bucks is totally fine. There's really no reason to get cute and bet here for something like seven or eight, which is kind of a more normal bet size. But in a one, two game, I would definitely suggest not betting with white chips if you can avoid it post flop. Simply makes life very, very, slow dealers have to make change a lot of the time so unless it's a game where there's a lot of white chips in play i'm just going to stick with a nice round bet and 10 is going to do the job here so we end up getting called by the original limper and also get called by the button so we end up going three way to the turn and there's no complaints for me on this turn card being the five of spades does not fill up that flush draw so definitely want to continue firing you could consider going for a check raise but i think just betting here for pots just going 40 is going to be much much better End up getting a fold from the hijack. Button very quickly continues. Double check that I still have a straight, and I do. River is very, very nasty. Being the king of clubs does put up the four straight, so now our opponent just has to have a 10 in order to chop out with us. In that all being said, I do still continue firing. I fire this for 40 bucks, and... Honestly, on such a sucky river, it's one of those where, yes, I probably should have bet a little bit larger, but I'm really just trying to make sure that my opponent comes along with pretty much all of their two pair combos. If they have another 10, obviously it just sucks to be us. We're just going to chop this one up. 
but I do think betting is better. If we look at the way this player has played so far, this is the same player from the previous hand where they were also on the button. And I just think this is going to be way better to bet it rather than hope that they decide to fire. They're probably not going to turn enough hands into bluffs. They're probably not going to bet ace x often enough, but they seem like the kind of player who's more likely to call with those kind of combos and won't actually bet themselves. So because of that, I definitely like firing here. And again, I'd like to bet this bigger, but on such a horrific card, I think you're going to have to scale back just a little bit, even though I think 50 bucks is probably just a shade better than 40 here. So that all being said, our opponent doesn't waste too, too much time. Before throwing out a raise to 100, I just snap call it, show my hand, and unshockingly, they also show a 10 with queen 10 of clubs. <sighs> Must be nice to get there, but what are you going to do? And again, I'm happy with the overall line. I made them pay a premium at every single inflection point leading up to the river. They just happen to get there and chop out with us, so what are you going to do? Anyway, at least I'm getting some of the pot as opposed to none of the pot. Fine. Okay, whatever. Let's get on to the next one. Quite a while later, we find ourselves on the button, and I do decide to button straddle, something I will occasionally do, especially in specific dynamics with players on the left. In this situation, the small blind is a very active individual, and I thought that straddling would create a very, very good dynamic for me. Look down at ace king of diamonds, and after a complete from the small blind and big blind, and also a call by the cutoff, decide to raise this up to 30 total. Raising totally, totally standard. Size is totally fine as well. End up getting called by the small blind. Big blind goes away. Cutoff goes away as well. End up going heads up to the flop. Flop is 5-3 deuce with a backdoor flush draw for me. So gut shot over cards and backdoor draw. They check. I decide to fire for 35. I think overall betting here is going to be just just fine. Now you could certainly make an argument for just checking this behind and taking the approach of getting sticky on a lot of turns and honestly on a lot of rivers given the small SPR, but I think in the average 1-2 game there's going to be a lot of mistakes that your opponents make and they're going to play extremely predictably. They're going to call here pretty much with any single ace-x hand because they feel compelled to. Any pocket pair is likely going to get check called as well. I don't think they're going to be check raising anywhere near correctly in a situation like this. And because of that, I think they can put in a decent chunk of money that they're not going to feel quite comfortable following up with on a lot of turn cards. So I think it allows me a lot of semi bluff potential over on the turn where they get sticky on flop and then fold a lot on turn, something I'm totally, totally okay with overall. So again, you could take either approach the check and get sticky on future cards or just fire here. I think firing is going to be a little bit better. So with all of that said, the small blind does eventually put out the call. Turn is the Jack of Diamonds. They check again, and I shove all in. So let's talk about it for a moment. So while there are a lot of different turn cards that I'm going to get very aggressive on, the Jack of Diamonds is obviously one of the best ones for us because it does give us that backdoor flush draw, and it also is an over card to a lot of the small, medium pocket pairs that our opponent could have, things like pocket sixes, sevens, eights, things that not necessarily should have been played that way pre-flop, but I'm not completely shocked if they do get taken that way. So because of that, I'm totally fine shoving it all in. If my opponent relinquishes 100% of their equity with something like ace-queen or ace-10, okay, fine, is what it is. And if our opponent gets sticky with any of those pairs, well, we always have an absolute grip of equity on the back door, so I'm okay with that as well. So I'm not totally upset with this. We could do a full math breakdown. I'll avoid doing that for this video, but if you want to see that, leave a comment and I might do a full one in a future video. But for now, totally okay with the shove. And our opponent thinks for a little while, still thinking, still thinking, and they finally put in the call. River is the Ten of Hearts. I totally brick. And our opponent shows Queen Ten of Diamonds. What? All right, so now that we know our opponent's whole cards, let's go back and review this entire hand real quick and see what our opponent did at every single inflection point. So going back pre-flop, they decided to complete here. Eh, not great. Then they decided to call this. Not great at all. Okay, put themselves in an extremely bad pot, out of position, with no initiative edge, skill edge probably not there either, so not great so far. On the flop, decide to call half pot with queen high and a backdoor draw, and because they didn't lead out on the turn, I can't imagine they had like a donk shove turn take it away a lot of the time approach here, so not really sure what the plan is. 
decide to check call there. River, I'm sorry, turn is one of the best turn cards they could get, and they still take about two minutes to make a call with one of the best things they could have in their backdoor range. I am very confused. Not very confused about the river. This one happens way more often than I care to admit, but I don't know what the heck is going on here. So I end up making the payoff in this situation, and honestly, maybe I'm just a bit salty because this player, come to find out, knew who I was and then didn't tell me until much, much later in the session. I don't like that. But I totally understand, no stress. Payoff made over to you. Nice hand, sir. Let's get on to the next one. A little while later, we are in the cutoff. Our friend to the left has decided they also like to button straddle, so they take that option. Look down at ace 10 off. There's a complete from the small blind, a limp behind from EP2. I decide to attack to 20. You could make an argument for making this something like 25 30. I just thought, based upon the way the game was playing right now, 20 would be just fine and would create a fine SPR, as opposed to completely shrinking it up into absolutely nothing. Get called by our friend on the button. Small blind comes along as well, as does the early position player. So we end up going four way to it. Gotta love one too. Flop comes, ace, king, six, rainbow. Checks to me, I decide to fire for 25. And I think firing this is totally fine. And size wise in such a bloated pot, the size is totally standard as well. You gotta keep in mind that when we're playing straddle pots, the SPRs tend to be very, very small because you're essentially doubling the stakes of the game for that individual hand, which means that when I'm in a situation like this, I'm functionally thinking about this like a 2-5 hand where it's a much, much smaller SPR and I'm just going to go from there. So our friend on the button goes away, get called by both of the other players. Turn is an absolutely brutal king of diamonds. They both very quickly check over to me. I check behind. River is a 10 of diamonds. Bet of 75 by the early position two player. And this is just honestly kind of a sucky situation where what the heck are they really betting here with that I beat, right? I'm hoping they have what? ace four but even if they have ace four i chop here right my two pair with the ace 10 doesn't matter so it's aces and kings with a 10 kicker for me even if they have ace five or ace deuce like i'm completely just chopping that and obviously there are definitely king x combos that our opponents can have so against two players am i really fading the king against both players maybe against the player in the small blind but i don't think this particular player is betting 75 unless they have a king so it kind of sucks, but at the same time, I think folding is going to be way, way better than just kind of getting sticky here. So I do think for a moment, just trying to replay it, see if I can come up with anything that makes sense for me to call. I don't want to see raising making a tremendous amount of sense. Player in the small one takes a very, very long time here. Like, honestly, it's been like two minutes at this point. They finally make the call. Both players show their king and both of them end up chopping the pots. I don't know what the heck the small one was waiting so long for, and I don't know how the heck both players spiked that case king on the turn. More uh, good luck, but at least when I'm running bad in a situation like this, it's not costing me the entire stack, so there are worse things in the world. But ultimately, again, I think preflop totally fine. Could be a pinch larger. The flop bet totally fine, and I really like the size. Turn and River, I'm very, very glad that I decided not to double barrel the turn. That turn card is just so incredibly brutal. And because the average 1-2 player just simply is not betting 75 on that River with enough air, I think getting rid of the Ace-10 there is going to be much, much better than trying to find a sticky call. And I don't think really turning it into a bluff makes any sort of sense either. So totally fine with this one. Nice case spike on the turn, guys. Let's get on to the next one. A while later, we are in the big blind. Our friend open limps under the gun. Strong play. Two more limps. The button decides to attack to 15. Look down at ace king suited in the small and just decide to call this. And well, obviously I like to play ace king very, very aggressively preflop overall. This is a situation where I think flooding is a pinch better because the button had been so darn tight in the session with any amount of preflop opening and especially isolating. 
So I didn't really see three betting doing a tremendous amount other than just absolutely punishing myself against a very, very nutish range. And while I don't particularly love playing ace king in a very multi-way pot that tends to get very bloated very quickly, I do prefer doing so with the suited variant much more so than the offsuit variant. So that is factoring in here at least a little bit. But again, really make sure you know who the open raiser or the isolator is preflop before you just blindly three bet. I think a lot of players get themselves into trouble because they just automatically fast play ace king preflop. And while overall that's typically a very good idea, there are definitely nittier opponents or nittier ranges in select situations where I think it makes a little bit more sense to be a bit more cautious. So keep that in mind, and that's why I like flatting rather than three betting in this exact situation. So as it rolls out, our friend to the left decides to limp fold. Not really sure what's happening. One of the other limpers decides to call, end up going three way to a flop of eight, eight deuce with two diamonds. I check. Both of us end up checking over to the button who decides to C bet for 30. And I just decide to call here. I think calling is going to be much better than going for the check raise, just because what are you really check raising in a situation like this? And I'd also kind of like to just call here, let the original limp caller from Prefop also continue. I'm very good with that coming along as well. Even if they have something like pocket fives, pocket sixes, something that would definitely fold against the check raise. I think they have enough hands that can check call here that I get some extra value from. And is my opponent on the button really going to like bet fold if they have something like jacks on this board and I decide to check raise? I don't think so. Again, I think I'm really just punishing myself against a very, very nutty range. And I'm not even sure this person would always decide to see that in a multi-way pot with something like Ace King here. So because of that, I think check calling is going to be better than going for the aggressive check raise. So after we call, the other player unfortunately goes away, end up going heads up to the turn, which is a very beautiful seven of diamonds. I decide to lead this out for 30, and I think it's important to talk about why I like leading here as opposed to going for the check raise or even a check call. So one of the biggest things is I want to guarantee the money goes in right this moment. One of the worst things that can happen in my opinion is that this streak goes check check, and then it is very, very difficult to get stacks in on the river. Whether it's a clean river, nasty river, it doesn't really matter. I think it's just going to be difficult to get stacks inside. And the big thing that's going through my head right now is we are playing 1-2. And your typical 1-2 opponent, again, especially given the notes and information I gave Prefop about this player being tighter, especially on their opens and their isolations, I think this is someone who could mistakenly check back here with even something like pocket jacks with no diamond and look at this spot and just say, eh, I'm just going to play it a little bit more cautiously because they're fearful that the diamond popped off, even though they don't think a step ahead and say, oh, well, why not? Why let a fourth diamond roll off for free? They don't think that far. They just think, oh no, a flush improved. I should slow down and get cautious. I really, really, really do not want to miss out on value when our opponent has jacks with a diamond, jacks without a diamond, or any other hand. And pretty much everything that I think they would isolate with preflop and then decide to see about a multi-way flop with, I think is going to continue right this moment. So because of that, I want to guarantee the money goes in. One of the easiest ways to do that is just to bet yourself rather than risk that turn getting checked back. Now, as for the bet size itself, this is where things get a little bit interesting. And this is where we kind of get into the science versus art form of bet sizing overall. So if you're looking for information on the science part of bet sizing, definitely make sure to check out my new book, GTO Gems. There is a bunch of information about bet sizing, why multiple bet sizes in GTO is very, very important, how to formulate bluff to value ratios given different bet sizing. Grab your copy of GTO Gems today and get actionable insights from our years and years of solver exploration and analysis. That way you don't have to do all these solves on your own. You just get to get the big major takeaways and figure out how you can start putting them into your playbook immediately. Again, GTO Poker Gems is the name of the book. You can find it at redshiftpoker.com slash gems or look for it on Amazon if you prefer the paperback or Kindle. Again, GTO Gems, enjoy it. But if you're looking for the art form of this, this is what I think is really factoring in in this exact situation. Because again, I want to guarantee money goes in. I want to try to set it up for stacks on the river. And if we bet 30 or larger, we pretty much set it up for a pot sizer on the river. 
at minimum. So that's a good thing for me in a situation like this. However, I don't want to go so large that our opponent ever considers folding an overpair with or without a diamond. I think that would be the absolute worst thing that could happen here. And I think at 75 plus, that's going to happen more often than I'd like it to. Again, just given the fact that this is a 1-2 player who is on the tighter side of the spectrum, definitely seems a little bit more nervous and skittish. And as such, I don't want to risk them going away with that. I'd rather get two smaller calls than risk them folding to a bigger bet right this moment. So because of that, I think somewhere between 30 to 45 is going to be just fine. I really don't want to go 50 plus just from a price point, a psychology price point at this specific limit. So because of that, I think something like 40 is probably a little bit better. 30 is just a tad small. But again, at least I'm betting. But if I was going to tweak this a little bit, a little bit larger here, I think would be a pinch better. So all of that being said, we do fire out for 30. Our opponent pretty quickly calls. River is a five of hearts. And I fire for 140, leaving myself $10 back. I don't know what's with me in this hand and just like $10 of weird, stupid mistakes, but this is two streets in a row where I think $10 was just completely messed up. I really don't know why I bet 140 as opposed to just the rest of it, which again would have been 150 total. Happy at betting, obviously not going to be checking. I think we have to fire and try to get value from our opponent. Again, from all of those overpairs that just cannot find the fold button. And honestly, why would they? Our opponent finally puts in the call. Shows me jacks, no diamonds. And a nice little payoff is coming our way. So again, I think I missed $10, but there are worse things than missing just a $10 bet on the river. But again, I think it is very, very important to get very, very detailed with these kind of things. And the biggest thing in terms of the overall betting line, again, is preflop, the consideration of flatting versus just generally three betting, and also the turn whether or not you lead there or you just go for a uh, check. And again, I think leading is going to be a little bit better in this situation. All right, cool. Let's get on to the next one. A while later, I am in the hijack. There's an under the gun straddle four or five. Look down at pocket threes. Player to my right decides to open limp. I decide to limp it behind. And in a game that's not playing very aggressive with the isolations, I'm totally okay limping this back, even with a very, very predictable hand like this. End up getting a couple more calls. End up going very multi-way to an interesting flop of six, four, three with two hearts. So flopping bottom set is always fun. Everyone checks to the limper to our right who decides to fire this for 10, and I just decide to call here. So while I normally play my sets very aggressively post-flop, this is a situation where I think going a little slower, a little more cautiously is going to be a bit better. If nothing else, because the straddler can have all combinations of 5 deuce and 5 7, given the fact that they straddled and then check their option, that's definitely factoring in. Plus the blinds can have those kind of combos as well. The player directly behind us could have 5 7 suited. So there are definitely combinations that crush us and dominate us right this moment, even though we do have chunks of equity against that, of course. So that's factoring in a little bit. And also I think, okay, well, how are my opponents going to make more mistakes if I raise here or if I just decide to call here? And I think if I call, I can induce things like raises, especially from things like pair and draw hand behind me. That's really good, especially from the two players directly to my left. Versus if I decide to raise here myself, I think I put myself against pretty much the absolute strongest of my opponent's ranges and one where I think my threes just don't do quite as well versus just call here, make decisions, navigate it, and go from there. And sure, it sucks when we call here and the turn ends up putting up the four straight, but we can navigate that and handle that and we'll have a good chunk of equity when that does happen. So again, I think it leads me more towards just flatting this rather than going for the fast raise and playing your hand very, very face up in a situation where you could easily end up running into a bigger combo and one you're not going to really be able to get away from. So with all of that said, again, we just call. Player directly to our left decides to raise this 240 total. Small blind pretty quickly calls. Everyone else folds. The original better goes away. And because of the fact that the original raise came from our aggressive friend to the left of us, remember this is the person with queen 10 of diamonds from earlier, and the small blind has a shorter stack even though they can have very strong hands, I think this is a situation where coming over the top makes a lot of sense. Again, I wanted to navigate this smartly 
And based upon who is involved at this point and the stack sizes of those players, this is why I think going for the call and then three bet is going to be much, much better in this spot. So I go up to 115 total. I think that's a size where the cutoff is going to feel like they have to continue with pretty much everything. Thought going for a shove here would be a little bit too much. Again, they seem to feel comfortable putting in smaller pieces multiple times. So because of that, again, I think 115 getting this in chunks as opposed to trying to get it all now where they could possibly talk themselves out of continuing, I think it's going to be a little bit better. Even though, yes, I do give them decent price when they have something like a pair and draw, but what are you going to do? I also give them maximum comfort when they have something like 6X that they talk themselves into just getting sticky with because eh, it's a pretty good price, you know, getting roughly three to one. Okay. So our opponent takes a little bit and finally cuts out that call. Small blind puts out the rest of theirs, which again is not very much more. There will be a main and a side in this situation. Dealer finally handles all the business. Turn, I decide to dark jam it before it even comes out, just because I thought that that would make this opponent very, very confused, and it definitely did exactly that. The turn happens to be the eight of spades. I was going to shove all turns anyway, so I just kind of did it. Not something I would overly suggest doing, but given the way that this opponent had been playing, I thought that it was more likely that they would look at this and probably call it with pretty much their entire range as opposed to ever consider finding a fold button. Show my hand. River is the nine of diamonds. <laughs> Our opponent mucks. Other player mucks as well and ship the whole caboodle right over this way. Not complaining about results. Again, kind of a little bit of a weird hand, if nothing else, because it's a straddle pot, if nothing else, because decided to take a slightly atypical slower line with the set on the flop. But again, I think when you really break this down and think about every single inflection point and what you're trying to accomplish, again, I'm trying to maximize mistake potential from my opponents. I'm trying not to only put myself against the nuts. And I think that can happen more often if I do decide to just outright straight raise on the flop. That is kind of all getting factored in in this situation. So kind of a weird, goofy hand, but okay with the results. Not complaining the slightest. Let's get on to the next one. A little while later, I am in the big blind. Our friend to our left opens under the gun to 10. Folds around. Look down at red threes. Decide to call this. Eh, not my favorite defend in the entire world, but I thought there were enough implied odds to go for it. Flop is even better. 4-3-3 three, three this time. Check. He checks behind. Turn is the 10 of clubs. I check, and honestly, a lot of the time I'm going to fire the turn myself, but this seems like the kind of player who would just never, ever let this get checked all the way through, that they're pretty much going to fire the bulk of their holdings over on the turn, whether they have the big hand that they were slow playing or more realistically nothing that they were just kind of waiting to see what happens. I think if I check the turn, they're going to bet 100% of the time, and then I'm going to go from there. And in this exact situation, I decide to go for a check raise up to 55 total. Pretty much with the thought process that I can induce my opponent to make a tremendous amount of mistakes. And I say that because this is the kind of situation where I really don't have very many, quote, real hands, right? Maybe I have pocket fours, maybe I have pocket threes, I almost certainly don't have pocket tens, and am I really going to check raise here with something like four five or ten nine or anything like that? Probably not a tremendous amount of the time. I don't have over pairs really here ever. So this check raise looks really, really goofy and bluffy. The jig is up at this point. I do know that this person knows who I am and does watch the vlog. So I'm like, eh, okay, I think they're going to make a decent chunk of mistakes against this check raise. Now, I do think that's going to involve a little bit more three betting and also just a tremendous amount of continuance overall. And probably with, again, a bunch of hands that aren't going to be particularly strong. So really my thought here is check raise here get a decent amount of continuance from my opponent, and then check a lot of rivers and hope that they have the busted things like Queen Jack and Ace Jack and Ace Eight and whatever other silly goofy stuff is going on and try to get that to make a tremendous amount of call here, bet river mistakes, and I can go forward and capitalize from there. So they do actually oblige and call very, very quickly against the check raise. Double check that I have what I have. And for what it's worth, this is a room that is running a high hand promo bonus right this moment. And if I hit, which I already have, so the quads 
satisfy that. And then there's like one or two minutes left in this promo period. So I'm pretty much guaranteed to get the 500 from this hand, the 500 bonus. And I don't need to see showdown in order to do that. So I just need to show my hand at any given point and then I can get that bonus. So I'm not concerned. It's not like if I check raise and my opponent folds that I somehow lose that bonus. So that is factoring into the back of my head. And when you play in a room that has promos like that, always kind of get the lay of the land, ask for the rules on exactly what needs to happen in order for a high hand to kind of get classified appropriately. So again, if our opponent folds right here, I still get the high hand bonus, not a problem. So again, our opponent calls river is the nine of hearts. I follow up with the plan I had mentioned where I check the river and they check behind with king queen. I don't understand how they don't bet the river. I was really expecting to induce a bet on the river with a whole bunch of hands exactly like this. These hands that don't really have much showdown value that our opponent is just going to assume, hey, you know what? I can decide to fire this and turn it into a bluff and that's going to be better. I was really expecting like a $75, $100 bet from our opponent and we could easily max value from there. Unfortunately, they just check it behind. Surprises the hell out of me. Of course, I still win the hand, not a problem. Still win the high hand bonus, not a problem. But I can't believe I didn't make more money on this hand, actually. It's very rare to get a full payoff or even a decent payoff when you do flop something as big as quads, but I really did expect to make a little bit more of this situation. So our opponent uh, got off the hook a little bit, but again, overall, the flop and turn specific line, I think are very, very important here. But at this point, I have to wait it out to get paid my bonus. I am very, very tired at this point, I should mention, as typically I am up at about four in the morning. So playing these later night sessions can be a little bit tough for me and I'm very exhausted. Normally I would be racking up within the half hour, but I have to wait for this promo period to end and then I have to wait for the payout to work and all that fun stuff. So that's kind of laying a little bit of foreshadowing for the next and last hand in this session. All right, in this last hand, we are in the cutoff. There's a $5 button straddle, small blind completes. So raised to 10 by a newer player down an ace 10 off, call by our player to the right. Decide to three bet this up to 35, which is a little bit small, but I thought that it was going to do just fine. The $10 raise, I wasn't giving a tremendous amount of respect to. Not sure if they just weren't really paying attention to the button straddle or what, but it's a little bit small, but they either don't know what they're doing or they're not paying attention. And either way, I'm totally fine three betting this as opposed to just flatting and letting this go very, very multi-way. So there's a shove for 210 total from the small blind. Both the other players get out of the way. And now we're thinking. All right, so obviously overall getting it in or even thinking about getting it in with ace 10 offsuit preflop is not something I would typically advise. However, we got a couple of things going on here. First and foremost, this is a straddle pot, which means we are roughly effectively playing a two five hand, which means we're roughly effectively looking at 40 big blinds effective. At 40 big blinds effective, I will gamble pretty hard, so not a problem. Now, the small blind can definitely have stronger hands. A lot of players will kind of play the complete game from the small blind in a straddle pot where there's a button straddle with a lot of combinations of very, very strong hands. But I'm also thinking there's going to be a decent chunk of the kind of predictable combinations as well. Things like pocket sixes, pocket fives, and things like maybe ace five suited and stuff like that. So I think there are combinations in our opponent's range that obviously completely crush us, but I think there's also probably a decent chunk that I do decently against as well. And given the fact that we are getting one and a half to one here, well, it's not the worst situation in the world. We probably have roughly amount, uh, that amount of equity anyway. And again, at 40 big blinds effective, I think this is okay. If you have information one way or the other, this can bend very quickly. And as a pure, pure default, again, I definitely do not suggest getting ace 10 all on prefop. However, I think there are situations to do it. And I think this could possibly be one of those. That all being said, I tend to prefer to make this kind of decision when I'm fresh and thinking very, very clearly, not when I'm very tired at the end of a session. And again, probably should have racked up a little while ago. I'm still waiting for that high hand payout at this point. So I'm giving this a lot of consideration. And after our opponent over in the hijack decides to fold, I ask my opponent if they want me to call. They don't give me much of an answer. So I end up making the call and show my hand because that's what I do. 
My opponent shows their hand as well, and they have aces. Great. But the flop is jack-10-5, 10, 10 on the turn, sweet, 3 on the river, and I don't realize at this point that my opponent has the ace of spades. I'm very confused at this point why I'm not getting the pot shipped to me because I thought that I had trips and did not realize that my opponent had a flush. So if you're ever wondering, am I very, very tired and should I quit a session, or is there proof that I should have quit a session a little while ago, this is one of those. When you're so tired of getting ace-10 all on preflop and you also can't read the board, typically a good side you should have racked up at least a little bit ago. But even with this little misstep at the end and complete misread of the board, my bad, this was still a very nice profitable session. Ended up playing for about six hours, ended up making 942, which includes the $500 high hand bonus, which got paid out a little bit after this final hand, made 157 per hour or 314 BB per hundred. So no complaints at all about the results. And that's going to wrap it up for this one. I really hope you enjoyed. And if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. Or if you're just excited that we're finally going to jump up to 2.5 in the next vlog episode, definitely give the video a thumbs up for that as well. I really appreciate it. And if you're not already subscribed, make sure to do that too, since you're already down there anyway. But thank you so much for hanging out today. I really hope you enjoyed. If you haven't already checked out GTO Gems, make sure to pick up your copy today. Again, redchippoker.com slash gems to learn more, grab your copy, or just look for GTO Poker Gems on Amazon. As always, if you need anything at all, don't hesitate to let me know. Otherwise, good luck out there and happy grinding.